All right, everyone, it's time for our last segment, second to last, actually, we don't count the reception. So let me introduce our final speaker for the day, that is Alison Thomas, who has just, what, a month ago or so, started her new role as Assistant Dean for Academic Integrity. Welcome, Alison. Thanks. Thank you. Um, no pressure. Last session. I hope this is your last session of the day. Um, I'm going to I'm going to do what I feel like I do to my students every semester, which is pretend like my class is the very most important class and the best class and the most fun class. I'm just going to go with that. Um, my name is Allison Thomas. Uh, can everybody hear me? OK, it's online. It's OK. OK. Um, as we get ready for back to school, I wanted you to know who I am. I wanted you to know that I'm here. I have an office with a small team. Uh, we're here to help faculty and students and staff across the university. I'm the Assistant Dean for Academic Integrity. I just started this role. So in addition to offering myself as support and guidance, I will also let you know um, that I ask for your patience uh, over the next year. Um, I've been at AU. This will be my 17th year. Uh, I've taught uh, for a long time in the writing program in the literature department, creative writing, teaching the American Studies program as well. Um, so I feel like I know our students. Um, I don't want to lose that connection that I have with students. I'm going to work really hard to um, make sure that I'm seeing students throughout the year um, as well as faculty. Um, I mentioned that we have an office. This is also new. Um, so the former structure uh, had us kind of handling academic integrity issues in individual units. So SIS had their um, system, CAS had their system, et cetera. Um, and we've uh, moved to a centralized system in the name of fairness and consistency, but really also to make sure that we can provide more robust support and guidelines, guidance for faculty, for students, and for staff. Um, and so we can launch the next phases of our academic integrity code revision. This has been a really long process, sort of interrupted for a number of reasons by COVID. Um, and so that's part of our work um, this year. This is really kind of our three main goals. If you haven't checked out the Academic Integrity Code, it is online. Um, you should take a look at it. it there, there are things about it that are very old. Um, it's from 2007. That's the last time it was really significantly revised. Um, when I talk to students about this, I joke that it was like chiseled on a wall in 2007. I mean, no wearable technology, um, no, um, no uh, cell phones even really um, that students were using. Um, the code itself is linked from that top link, the academic integrity code. It looks like a policy. Our lawyers insist that we um, link to it from the policy library. Um, these videos are a little bit old, but still get at the heart of academic integrity. And we'll be keeping these as sort of placeholders as we develop new tools. Um, but I think it's important to recognize, um, I assume that all of you have had various experiences at at university and in in educational institutions. Um, and it's worth noting that not, it, there's no one size fits all policy for academic integrity. So our policy may not look like an institution you've been at before. It may not look like um, your, uh, the institutions where you've studied. And so it's really important for you to review what's in there and be able to talk to students about it. Um, so I'll highlight sort of some of the faculty responsibilities and rights that our code kind of um, demands. Um, maybe in some ways, things that make it different from what other policies might look like. Um, so faculty cannot penalize students based on the perception that they've violated the academic integrity code. So our code lists a few things. There's uh, uh, things like plagiarism, inappropriate collaboration, dishonesty in examinations, dishonesty in papers um, that students should, uh, should, should not do. Um, I could talk more about that in a minute. Um, but if a faculty member believes that one of those things is happening, uh, they can't issue a penalty on their own. So they can't say, you know what? This paragraph is lifted from Wikipedia. I'm just gonna give you an F on this paper and we'll call it a day. Can't do it. Um, and that's because our code guarantees students a kind of due process. That students get to participate in the process. They get to be heard. They get to respond. 
the outcome may be a failing grade on a paper or a failing grade in the course, but our process ensures that students get to participate in that process and that those decisions are made by a neutral third party, not a faculty member. Um, my experience with this in talk from my from my own experience and also from talking to faculty members about this is that there's a kind of security in that, that if something comes up, uh, you can still focus on your primary work of teaching students and doing your research and going about your business. And the Office of Academic Integrity handles things like, where was this lifted from? Um, what is the real issue here? Do I have to talk to multiple students? Do I have to try to do some like investigative work to figure things out? We don't really want faculty to have to do that. Um, and so the Office of Academic Integrity handles that. Um, there's also some awareness of student needs when it comes to accessibility and accommodations that I think are really important for faculty to be aware of and to be responsible for. Um, if a student has extra time on a test, if a student is able to use other resources in doing an exam or um, doing certain assignments for the course, you really want to be mindful of that when you create certain um, uh, assessment opportunities. So I've heard a lot of faculty members, especially given our kind of artificial intelligence moment, saying things like, well, I'm just going to have students handwrite everything during class. Um, and so that kind of overcorrection worries me a little bit because there are students for whom handwriting is not um, is is not a uh, they have accommodations to help with certain disabilities for, uh, that are related to handwriting, for example. Um, it might end up creating the need for more accommodations. So if you're making decisions about sort of how should I handle my assessments, given my concerns about academic integrity, my advice is always to connect it to your learning outcomes before your sort of fear that students are gonna cheat. Um, connecting to your learning outcomes, even when you're talking about these things to students, I think is really helpful. Um, you, there, there's no, the, the, being clear on your expectations for students is probably the most important thing. And this is hard because it involves sort of checking assumptions that you might have. It may seem obvious to me um, that a student shouldn't be resubmitting work they did in another class to my class, but that's not really obvious to students. And that's actually one that a student mentioned to me the other day. It's my work. I own it. What's the problem with me resubmitting it in a different situation? I don't get it. Um, and I think that's really important to discuss with students, but also to kind of check ourselves um, in terms of what we might expect students to know or assume students have experienced um, or is easily made sense of that maybe they can't. Um, you should be clear in your assignment instructions, put them in writing. You should include instructions for everything you have. Every test should have instructions. Every assignment should have instructions in writing. And the more you can attend to academic integrity needs for each assignment, the better. So not all, academic, not all assignments are gonna have the same kind of requirements, right? So if you have a written assignment, um, maybe you need to attend to things like paraphrasing or provide resources for paraphrasing or something like that. Whereas on a test, you want to be clear, these resources are acceptable, these resources are not acceptable. Um, attend to the specific academic integrity needs um, of, every, uh, of every assessment. And then when you have any concerns, no, no matter sort of how certain you feel, um, you can always get in touch with our office. We have a generic email, um, academic integrity at american.edu. Um, but I'll also tell you who you can talk to. Um, our initial conversations with faculty are confidential. So if you're sort of like, I've got this situation, I don't know what's going on here, what should I do? Um, it's a confidential conversation until and unless we decide this is the case and now we're gonna move forward with it. Um, so you can always call us and ask us for advice. In terms of your rights, I want you to know that um, Faculty have the right to teach. That's really sort of where this comes from. Um, to, to me, a faculty member can decide, I'm looking at this paragraph that seems like word for word the same as what's in Wikipedia, but here we are in week two. I haven't re really had a chance to clarify what paraphrasing really is. I haven't really talked a whole lot about citation. I think I wanna give this student another chance because there's an opportunity for me to teach them something. I'm gonna sit down with the student. I'm gonna go over what the issue is. I'm gonna direct them to some resources. I'm gonna explain what the problems are and what they can do to practice so that it doesn't happen again. They can resubmit the work, all of it, or in part. 
and I'm going to give them a new grade, no penalty, no late, no late marks, um, a new, a fully new grade. So as long as I don't penalize the student's work based on the perception that it's plagiarized, then I can go this route. There are a few things that come up when somebody's thinking about whether to go this route. First, you can always call our office and we'll talk you through it. Um, but really, this is sort of, you want to be thinking about um, whether or not you'd offer this opportunity to other students in the class. So it can't be, I want to give you a chance because you're, you look like me or your experience is like mine or I like you. That's not an adequate reason to execute a kind of teaching moment. But it might be a good reason if, like I said, having a conversation about this, clarifying some of the, um, the teaching goals, the specific skills that a student could work on and practice and improve on if they resubmitted it. Like resubmitting it gives them something to learn in that moment. Um, so you wanna think about sort of some of those things. It may seem also unfair. If it seems unfair to other students to allow a student to resubmit, then maybe it's not a teaching moment. Um, so uh, the other faculty rights I have here, one, the second one I mentioned already, we want you to be able to focus on teaching and research. And so you have the right to sort of like not dig deep into a kind of investigative process. Our office needs enough to get started. I can tell you a little bit about what that means, um, but we don't need you to sort of like get involved in um, Googling phrases for three hours on everybody's papers. Um, uh, and then you also have the right to support and guidance in the process. Um, I've talked a lot about artificial intelligence and academic integrity over the last February. It feels like a really long time, but it's so new. Um, and it's already, I've already sort of changed the way I'm talking about it uh, in some ways. Um, early on, I would say in January, our community started having really uh, high level conceptual conversations. Like, what does this mean? This sort of like existential crisis, like the robots are gonna take over. Um, what does this mean for our teaching? Does this mean more work for me? It always does. Um, but uh, then I started seeing actual situations. So um, in the spring, um, I, I heard a lot of faculty saying things like, I don't think this is actually gonna be that big of a deal. I don't think it's gonna be an issue. Students love my class. Uh, and my assignments are so cool and creative and fun. Um, or I, I include a lot of like reflective reflection papers, it's like personal experience. Um, and I was sort of like, yeah, yeah, you do it. That's great. And then two weeks later, I was like, oh my God, um, because AI can create reflection papers that sound real, um, that are personal. Um, it can, uh, they can make citations that look real. Um, it can generate essays that are, for some assignments, sort of serviceable. Um, and, and I saw it happening. I saw a lot of students using not just chat GPT. Um, I saw students using um, tools like Illicit, which is sort of a research assistant. I saw students using Cite and other sources that um, summarize for you. That was a big one. Like you put an article in, the tool spits back a summary um, for students who are feeling not very confident about their ability to read and process complicated materials. These seemed like really great help tools. Um, and I think for me, uh, looking at the sort of AI cases I saw highlighted two things. One, when students don't understand texts, oftentimes the last place they go is their professor. The first place they go is the internet. I already knew that, but this really showed me um, how much trust students put in like the internet, capital T, capital I, for help, help. Um, and then the second thing is it reminded me what I already knew also about research and how students often think about research. Um, so I had a lot of students say, you know, there were 10 sources required for my paper. So I went to ChatGPT and I asked it to find me 10 sources about you know, this particular topic, and it gave me 10 sources. And then I wrote the paper, and then I threw those sources in somewhere. Um, and so this really highlights for me um, this notion that research is sort of like something that's required, and you can kind of just put it anywhere. 
Um, and it's sort of divorced from like the humanity of like, there's a person who made that, right? There's a person whose life's work is oriented around that. Um, and so these are really, if this is helpful in terms of like the kinds of conversations to initiate with students about this, I hope that you will. Um, what I said to colleagues after this was, this is absolutely happening, please don't ignore this. Even if you're saying something like, there's no place for AI tools in my classroom, um, my advice is to engage with the topic, to think about why or why not, and to connect those with your learning outcomes. So in my class, if I'm teaching um, writing, uh, then the things that generate writing are gonna get in the way of the things I want students to be able to do by the time the class is over, right? On the other hand, sometimes I have them do presentations using PowerPoint. And PowerPoint helpfully selects images based on the text you put in, like elephants. Is that an issue? I'm not evaluating their design skills, right? I'm, I don't, it's okay if they're using PowerPoint, right? If this were a design class, that would be a different story, right? And so if students can kind of understand that, understand the kind of conceptual basis for why or why not, um, certain generative AI tools can be used, um, then maybe they can sort of take that and kind of transfer that to other situations. Um, oh, I forgot to mention this one, detection tools. Um, some of you may be familiar with the freely available and then some um, paid, paid tools, uh, pay for tools um, that detect artificial intelligence, the use of artificial intelligence. Turnitin has one and we subscribe to turn it in. We don't specifically subscribe to their originality detector, but lo and behold, there it appeared on one day. I could tell you almost what time because five minutes later I had six to nine emails from faculty saying, I have really a hundred percent scores. I've got a case, let's go. Um, and, and my answer was, what? Um, because we weren't told that this was coming. We couldn't opt out of it. Um, there's a lot of discomfort potentially with these tools because artificial intelligence uses uh, freely available data on the web and some not freely available data. Um, and uh, now we're contributors to it potentially. Um, so Turnitin is kind of using our stuff to learn more and become better at what it's trying to do. Um, but in terms of academic integrity and whether or not I use this, I don't and I won't. Um, it's been, uh, the consensus on this is that these tools are not reliable in determining whether something is generated by AI. Um, and in fact, there's been a number of circumstances where um, students are not using AI tools and these and they get flagged anyway. And this is really, for me, harrowing. I visited with some students last week who said, um, one woman said, her friends told her that they started entering, like writing their papers and then uploading it to a detection tool to see if it would get flagged before submitting it. Because they wanted to see if they were gonna get flagged for original work that they created before getting flagged for it. So this really tells you that students are kind of like on edge about this. They're anxious about getting flagged for something they didn't do. Um, and so, and not to mention how that complicates the kind of, if this tool gets used again by someone else, right? Um, and so I thought that was really interesting and very troubling. Um, I did some sessions with CTRL last week. I think those uh, recordings and materials are available. Um, I'll also give you one more resource where you can find stuff, but this is kind of super quick. Um, some syllabus advice as you think about not just AI, but um, any kinds of tools um, in, in your class, what kinds of sources are, are of help are okay to use in your class? Um, so that means like if a student's like, I need a tutor, should they go get a tutor from the internet or should they go back to their community and find a tutor from there? Um, or do you prefer they ask you first? Do you prefer they work with AU um, services for my, for me? Personally, I want students to tell me if they feel like they need a tutor. I want I want them to know that I'm their first stop if they have questions about the course. But I also really want them to use AU's tools. I want them to go to the Academic Support and Access Center. I want them to go to the Writing Center. I want them to use academic coaching because those are places where I know I can trust those people who, who 
run those offices, to respect the student's agency, and to make sure that all the work that students are doing, that they're getting help with, is, is it's legitimate help. It's not help. It's not um, you put in your credit card and someone else writes your paper for, for you. Thank you so much for that help, right? There's some, some language there, right? Um, and then for generative AI tools, um, are you advising students against using them? Why in the context of your learning outcomes? Can you be specific? And I'll point you to a resource that kind of gives you some sample language for different sort of tiers of AI use. So if you're kind of wanting to restrict use versus if you're sort of like, well, moderate use on some things versus um, sure, go for it, do it. Um, there are three sort of specific sets of language that you can use if you want to borrow from it. Um, and then where can you give additional detail or clarification about what certain parts of the academic integrity code actually mean? The code right now is written like a legal document. I mentioned it lives in the policy library. It's written in the same voice and tone as the document that says you can't have space heaters in your office. You can't have space heater in your office. They'll take it away. Um, and so that means that it needs a kind of like translation, right? Um, it means that students won't find it necessarily accessible. I don't really find it accessible. Um, I've been working with it for a really long time, um, but that's not true um, for people who are reading it once. Um, CTRL has some syllabus um, guidance and there's a template you can use um, from, from them. Uh, it has like a general statement about academic integrity. Um, I recommend taking that, using that, and then jumping off from that into sort of what's specific to your discipline, to your area of study, to your professional situation, um, maybe working with your colleagues to think about um, the ways you can be clear about your specific expectations when it comes to academic integrity. Um, recognize that putting it on the syllabus isn't enough, um, that uh, this has to be discussed over and over. Um, I would also encourage you not to um, rely on the notion that if students learned about this in one place, they remember it. Um, we certainly work with students in the writing program to think about academic integrity and work with academic integrity related skills and concepts. But that doesn't mean that they're going to transfer it and apply it to, to your course necessarily. So think that think about that. Um, and then recognize that some common causes include lack of experience, time management, um, skills for engaging with difficult texts, um, a disconnect from learning outcomes or course materials. These are sort of some of the reasons I see students. Um, I would encourage against things like response papers, where you're like, write a response to what you read in The Great Gatsby. Um, it's sort of like, um, you know, you're going to get a lot of stuff about the green light, um, and it's probably not going to be super original. Um, and so I encourage you to sort of think creatively about the assignments that you that you make. And if you want students to respond to a text, um, think about the specific questions you can ask them to get them to dig into the bits that you really want them to engage with. Um, this is a really quick smattering of some sample language that um, the top two kind of are directly from the code. And those are the two pieces of our policy that relate to generative AI tools um, that uh, we assume that all work a student submits is their own. And this is kind of the, the, the way that I frame this for students. 100% of the work that you submit should be 100% your own, 100% of the time, generated for this learning occasion. Um, if you're submitting stuff from a different learning occasion, then you've kind of disrupted the academic project. Um, fabrication is something we've seen a lot. Um, the fake sources that can be generated by AI tools. Um, that was probably the bulk of AI tool cases I saw in the spring. Um, citations that look real, maybe even journals that are real, maybe even people, authors that are real, um, the stuff they didn't write. Um, and so that constitutes the falsification, distortion, or invention issue. Um, def definitions of plagiarism, and including this one, this is actually um, like a kind of underrepresented concern because AI is like the loudest thing in the room right now. Um, but misrepresentation of sources is one that I think is like, if not for AI, this would be on the top of my list right now. Um, uh, if stuff appears in the bibliography and you haven't read it, this is a misrepresentation, right? If you sit, if you um, 
use information or ideas and you say it's from a source and it's not, you've misrepresented something. So this often happens because students are like, oh, I need 10 sources in my paper. I'll write the paper and then throw in sources here and there. That's usually my sense of, of how that happens. Um, but it is a misrepresentation of sources. I find that talking about sources as people, as representations of humans and their work um, is sort of helpful. Um, and then also when you're putting source work together, when you're citing stuff, you're representing a process, you're sort of showing someone all the work, all the labor that you've done to sort of make it. Um, I found the language of shortcuts to be a helpful way to get into talking about AI with students. Um, that if you're using AI to shortcut something, that your professor is kind of, I need you to take the long cut here. If you're really going to learn this, we're going to have to go the long way, right? We're going to have to sort of go through this, um, you know, terrain, whereas the shortcut might actually keep you from learning the things that I'm hoping you're going to learn. Um, substitution is another helpful word that I've found um, in talking about this. That is, if you're substituting stuff that I expect you to be learning on your own or that I expect you to be practicing with something a robot or a machine is doing, um, then you're cutting off your ability to learn here. Um, the use of AI shouldn't be a substitute or a shortcut for, for learning you should be doing in the class. Um, I mentioned that there's a person in our office, Jacqueline Reynolds. She um, handles all kinds of faculty concerns. So if you have anything you see in your class at any time, you can always get in touch with her and just have a low key conversation, um, confidential um, conversation with her. It may become an issue, it may not become an issue. But she would walk you through that. Um, I'm available as well, I'm a thomas at american.edu. Um, my email is on the first slide, but um, you can always get in touch with me. I mentioned another resource. Um, so I have a SharePoint that is all academic integrity related resources. It's a work in progress. SharePoint is not my ultimate destination, um, but it is a, it's sort of a rest stop on the way to where I hope we're going. Um, but for now, I've been filling it up with resources that um, I've been sharing through these workshops um, and I'll continue to build it. There's news, uh, recent news. There's some uh, advice for AIC concerns, including artificial intelligence and syllabus building. Um, and uh, the sources from today's sessions will be on there as well. Um, so maybe that could be in the chat and links. To, thank you. Great. Um, that is it. I don't know if I left enough time for some questions. Two minutes. Or a little more. You have a, an online question? Yeah. Um, we have a question from someone online. It says, could you go into more detail on the faculty member's role in the classroom and how that is distinct from being a neutral party? Yeah. I can talk about this in a few ways. So I think as a faculty member in this moment, I can, I'll can. i start by speaking for myself, from my own experience. Um, when I've had concerns come up, it feels terrible. Like as a faculty member, you look at the paper and you're like, oh my goodness, this is like an elaborate attempt to pull one over on me. I'm offended, right? But I'm also like offended on behalf of the other students in that moment. I'm really just talking you through sort of my rainbow of feelings when I when, when this happens to me. Um, but uh, I'm offended for the other students too, because I'm like, wow, everybody worked really hard on this. And you worked really hard on something else, <laughs> um, putting together this deception. It feels um, it feels really bad. It's hard not to take it personally. My first instinct is to like write an email to the student detailing all the problems and why it's wrong and how bad this is. And they've corrupted the academic project and they've hurt their peers, they've destroyed our sense of community. And it's like, oh wait, maybe I should step back. Maybe I should hand this off to someone who is interested in making sure that the student's rights are valued, that the student gets to respond. And that if there are teaching, if there are teaching ways through this, and there always are, that we can find them. Um, and I'm hoping that like sort of the work ahead for us in the coming year values those teaching opportunities more than they currently do. But that's really kind of why the sort of neutral interest. Can I take, yeah, yes. 
Thank you so much. Um, I'm Sarah Gilchrist. I'm in the library. I used to work for student discipline and part of my job over the last 11 years has been to talk to students about academic integrity. Um, and so I'm wondering if, so usually I would introduce this idea in the class. Um, we're not teaching semester long classes as much as like visiting other people's classes, but if I was, and I introduced the idea and then noticed that students maybe weren't citing things correctly. Usually my first impulse is to kind of come back to the class and talk about some of the skills that we might need to develop in order to do that. Mm -hmm. Should I instead come to your office before I do that? Mm -hmm. If I notice that maybe people forgot to put in-text citations or, you know, they maybe they paraphrased something and they didn't cite it. Um, or do we just come to your office if there's some grave concern? Like what, where does that needle fall? Yeah, that's a really hard question. There's definitely a sort of spectrum of concerns. Sometimes it depends on sort of what have you covered in the class? Um, how much attention have you given this? How much can you expect from students in that moment? I do think if you're noticing oh, 15 out of 16 papers um, seem to not realize what our citation situation is, then I like the idea of having this conversation with everyone. Again, in terms of our code, as long as you don't penalize the student work based on plagiarism, then your teaching is your teaching, right? Um, and so I don't think, I think like that could be a reasonable approach. Um, as far as sort of like, well, there's a difference between citation mechanics mm -hmm. and an academic integrity violation, but it's a really, it's a really complicated zone there, right? So something like, well, this didn't, didn't use a comma or the student put the journal before the author title, or the student used MLA instead of APA. I think when there are gestures towards citation and they're clumsily done or they're sloppy or they ignore some of the um, sp like really specific kind of nuts and bolts of citation, I think that's different from an academic integrity issue. Um, so maybe that gets at gravity versus sort of something um, like I can put in my rubric, I can put citation mechanics in my rubric. You know, if a student uses MLA instead of APA, I could be like, cool, you cited sources according to one style, but not the one that I required. I can take points off for that. It's not because you plagiarized. It's not because you violated the code. It's because you didn't meet the expectations of my assignment. Really quick one. I'm Chaz Brooks from the uh, Washington College of Law. Um, I was going to ask about faculty rights and whether or not if you turn in a case to your office, if you lose the opportunity to kind of tailor the, the punishment, because I could see like a, a letter grade sometimes being more of a teachable moment than an absolute F on a project. That's a great question. So Washington College of Law has a separate code from what I've been talking about here, because they're bound by some professional obligations, the bar um, in particular dictates some of the things they can and can't do. Um, so I'm not sure the extent to which my answer to this question will be true for WCL. Um, but to answer the question for the this academic integrity code is, um, yeah, once the faculty member is submitting a, a case, then, then the determination on what happens is the Office of Academic Integrity. Um, while faculty can say, like, I think this should happen or I think that should happen, and that's certainly welcomed, um, the office has a greater purview in terms of, like, making sure that we're applying sanctions consistently and fairly across the spectrum, you know, of the university. So, um, yeah, you would lose sort of some control, although you don't really have a whole lot of control in the sense that, like, um, you're either you're either submitting it to us or you're not penalizing the grade for the concern. Just to reiterate that, does that answer your question? Yeah. So we are at time. So thank you so much, Allison. Thank you. Thanks for having me. If you have any questions, feel free to send an email. Also, I'm happy to um, work with you and welcome. All right, so we're at the very final component of today and I'm gonna wave to my friends in the back out there. They're on their way inside. So. Um, Amanda.